So I'm here in central Kansas with Justin Kanaw, who is planting wheat. Uh, we are we are actually riding in the truck right now, and I'm going to turn around and see the. I guess what what would you call this? Is this a planter behind us? We have a couple of different pieces of equipment, Justin. Yep, sure. This, so we're out uh, planting our wheat. Um, and we're riding a John Deere tractor. Um, and then behind us, we have our John Deere air seeder. And so the front part you see um, is actually doing the work. That's the seeder part of the tool. And that's actually doing the work of putting the seeds into the soil at the right depth and then covering them back up gently with a little bit more soil on top of them. Uh, so that's doing the seeding work, and then the uh, big cart behind the seeder uh, is the air cart. And that has three different tanks. Those big yellow things are uh, tanks, and it has three different compartments or tanks back there where we are holding both seed and uh, some fertilizer, a, a blend of uh, fertilizer that we are also putting uh, right next to the seed to give the seed a healthy start once it starts growing. So those tanks are holding those products and then at the bottom of those tanks is a meter that is turning uh, a, a calculated speed to give us the right weight per acre of both seed and fertilizer that we want to put in this field. Then at the very back of that cart is a big fan that's blowing air through all of those tubes. And that air then is the seed and fertilizer drops out the bottom of those tanks through those meters. That air is then blowing all that seed and fertilizer through all those lines that you see on the seeding. Okay, we are back with Justin Knopf here in Central Kansas facing winter wheat. Sorry, we got uh, disconnected. We are actually live here in a wheat field, so sometimes our connection has a little bit of a hard time. So, um, Justin, you, was, you were talking about the equipment um, that we have back here as an air seeder, and you said that it is um, planting it to the correct depth. What, what is that depth? Yeah, so I am uh, in this particular field. We are planting this each seed at about inch and a quarter to inch and a half deep. Um, actually, when I uh, move to a different field, I always recheck. I uh, get, I stop and get out and dig behind the, the cedar and check the seeds to make sure that we're placing them properly. It's a really important, probably one of the most important things we do in the uh, process of growing a, a crop. Uh, is placing the seed properly. Um, so the last field I was in actually had a little heavier, a little thicker residue on the soil surface than what we have here. So I needed, I was, when I first started here, I was set a little bit too deep. Um, so I shallowed it up about a quarter of an inch. And I think we're looking pretty good now. So you talked a little bit about the residue that you're planting into. Um, tell us a little bit about the residue that we see on this field. It looks like maybe you had it planted to soybeans before. Yep, that's right, Marcia. Uh, we just harvested soybeans off of this field um, earlier this week, and we are seeding direct direct seeding um, our wheat crop into um, that soybean residue. So we. We farm using no-till uh, farming practices, which means that we are continually leaving a mat of residue on top of the soil, which is very important to us and to the soil uh, to protect it from water and wind erosion. Um, there's a tremendous list of um, important things that I feel that does for our, uh, for our farming, our cropping system. It allows uh, earthworms and biology to uh, have a habitat that's consistent and allows them to uh, grow and multiply and allow the biology of the soil, uh, both things like earthworms and larger um, creatures to even microscopic creatures that would be uh, in the millions 
in a handful of soil to, uh, to partner with them and allow them to help us do a better job of raising our crops. So could you compare that to some of your uh, practices maybe even 10 years ago? How does that compare? Yeah, so we, uh, one of our goals uh, on our farm and similar to many farmers um, is to continually improve our practices. And so uh, as we learn and observe things in our farming and our cropping system, um, we just, uh, from those observations, try to learn. And so the movement to more no-till practices is one of those things that we've observed and tried to learn. So, so the main difference is now that we're not, uh, after, after we remove a crop, we're not tilling the soil. We're not taking, when I was young, we would take a plow or a disc out and turn all that residue under, leaving bare soil on top, and then, which makes it kind of cloddy and rough. And then the rest of the uh, preparation process, you would, we would uh, disc it a couple more times, perhaps with a, a tillage implement that's churning the soil pretty aggressively. And then we would, what we would call field cultivated, uh, which would basically kind of break out, break down any clouds that we had made or rough soil surface and kind of begin preparing a seed bed again. And then we're definitely, there's, you know, there's a lot of acres still farmed that way. In fact, the field right next to us uh, happens to be farmed that way. Um, we can get a little closer look if we go around again, but you'll see that between the little wheat plants that are up and growing, there's just bare soil. Um, our goal with no-till management is to not have bare soil because we want it to be protected and um, make it more resilient just to be, have a protective layer over the top of it all times of the year so we have uh, less opportunity for any loss from heavy rainfall or, or dry periods where we might have a lot of wind. We don't have any of it exposed to loss. So we can kind of see these rows over here where we've already planted. Yeah, and so we're planting right through that residue. And this is something that's uh, 15, 20 years ago, um, the equipment was more, the seeding equipment that we used was much more designed for a tillage-based system. So going into kind of what you would see as a garden, just turn over, over very bare soil that's nice and smooth, um, not residue on top. And today, and so we didn't have equipment that was designed for a condition like we're doing today with more no-till management, where we have all this residue on top of the soil surface, which is protecting it, but also makes it more of a challenge to really precisely cut through that residue and get the correct depth into the soil beneath that residue to place that seed. Um, so we have the engineers have done a nice job of improving our seeding equipment. Um, they recognize that this practice was something important and, uh, and they responded to what we were asking for in the marketplace and helped us and provided us with better equipment to where now we can do a pretty good job of slicing through that residue uh, to place the seed with very, very minimal disturbance to the soil and the habitat that we're trying to create in that soil. So about how many years have you been farming? So I'm a fifth generation uh, farmer here in central Kansas, and um, I've been farming full time, making my full time living uh, from farming since 2003. Um, I graduated from K-State in 2000 and then spent a couple years as an agronomist, um, kind of a plant scientist working in the seed industry and then came back to farm uh, with my brother. I have two brothers, one I farm with, the other has uh, his own uh, small business. Um, but Jeff, my brother and I started farming full time in 2003 and we farm with our dad. But how long I've been farming, of course, is a little bit different answer and that's a long time. Um, I'm 38 and started farming, well, running equipment when I was um, probably about six or seven years old, picking up hay bales with dad, running a tractor with a, a little wagon behind it. And then, um, remember, we were tilling our soil back then, and so running a field cultivator and 
So I've been running equipment and farming, you know, my whole life, as long as I can remember. Um, you know, this, the fall is a really, uh, I really enjoy the fall season and have a lot of memories uh, coming home from school and getting off the bus and mom would take me out to wherever dad was planting wheat at and I'd ride with him and it's, you know, planting wheat in Kansas is a wheat state and there's so much heritage um, to wheat planting time, similar to wheat harvest time in Kansas, there's a lot of activity in the fields and so, so it's a really nice time of year, the temperatures are nice and so I always think around this time of year when we're planting our winter wheat crop about those times when I was really young and we'd come home and ride around with dad when he was planting wheat and learning then just some of the early concepts about how you plant a seed and how that grows and what it takes to grow that crop through the year. And now we're doing the same with, you know, my brother has two boys, of, uh, two boys and uh, my wife Lindsay and I have a daughter and a son and uh, now our kids come out and, and spend time with us after school and learn, um, learn some of the same foundational truths, but a lot of it looks a lot different. You know, the technology we're using today is different. And the practices that we do are better for the environment and more sustainable. And, you know, we've got a lot of improvement left to do and a lot of things to learn, but we're moving in the right direction. So what other crops do you plant besides wheat? We know that you had soybeans in this field before. Yeah, we have a part of our cropping system. Uh, diversity is important to our cropping system and no-till farming system. So we grow uh, soybeans, winter wheat, we also grow some corn, uh, we grow quite a bit of alfalfa, which is a perennial crop, and that uh, brings us a lot of benefits uh, to our biological farming uh, system, and, and then grain sorghum is another important crop for us, uh, handles wheat, or excuse me, handles heat, and drought well, which we always have uh, our fair share of here in central Kansas. And then we're also kind of learning about and experimenting with cover crops, um, which are crops that are planted specifically, well, kind of like their name implies, specifically to add cover to the soil um, in between our, what we would consider our, our grain crops or our cash grain crops. So, so those cover crops, um, we're using a lot of different species, um, but for example, the last field I was seeding, before coming to this one, I mentioned had a little, I had to set the seed a little shallower on this one because the last field had a deeper mat of residue on top. And that part really was because um, after we harvested the corn last fall on that field, so we harvested, it was in corn, we harvested it last fall, and then right after we harvested the corn, we went right into that residue and planted triticale and canola, a blend of those seeds. Uh, Triticale is a winter annual grass, very similar to wheat, and in fact it's a cross between wheat and rye. And then also had uh, canola or rape seed mixed in with that at the same time, which is a uh, cool season broadleaf, which has a nice taproot on it. And that, those plants came up really nice and grew uh, throughout the fall and then overwintered and then grew again in the spring similar to wheat and gave us a really nice green growing crop out there all spring that was um, allowing the biology of the soil to work and to have nutrients to feed off of and that living root system uh, helped us with our weed control because we had a crop out competing weeds in the earlier part of spring but then, you know, we don't get paid anything for raising that crop, so its purpose is just for a conservation standpoint. So we sprayed that uh, cover crop out and terminated it uh, with a herbicide uh, in mid-May and then planted soybeans directly into that residue, uh, which was, of course, our, our revenue crop. And the soybeans did really good, and so that residue that we grew from that cover crop is still out there, still working for us, and protecting that soil, and it just seeded really nice. There's nice moisture there, and um, good, good cover for the soil. So that's one thing, you know, we're adding into our cropping system and learning over time. It's a biological system that we work with on a daily basis, has a 
infinite number of relationships that are very complex to understand, and so there's no black and white answers to you know some of the questions about our farming system, and we just try to observe and think critically and learn and improve as as we uh, go along. So you mentioned that you sprayed your cover crops with an herb with an herbicide. Um, what does that do? To, I mean, is that bad for the soil to spray those chemicals, and, and how does that affect the wheat that you're growing now? Yeah, that's a good question. A lot of people, when I um, talk about, uh, when farmers talk about using a herbicide or some sort of uh, chemical, uh, synthetic chemical process or, or um, product in our farming process, it's uh, it's something that concerns people, and that's really understandable. You know, it's. Um, it's something you know that's uh, the words natural and organic and um, are, are, are words that have a lot of good connotations with them and synthetic and chemical don't have very good connotations to, to them so it's understandable that people have questions and concerns about um, some of the things that we uh, use in our management uh, in our cropping system but you know, it's, uh, I think it's important to understand that these uh, products that we use are are very safe for the environment. Um, we think a lot about the environment. It's very important to us. And I think that um, it's, it's those tools are important to our uh, farming system. So um, if we didn't have, you know, if we didn't have the ability to use those tools, then our the ability, our, our ability to uh, produce a certain amount of grain, say wheat or bushels of wheat or loaves of bread uh, per acre, diminishes very rapidly. And so, uh, to me, I think it's environmentally responsible to use the tools that we have available to us that are um, not harmful to the environment when used the correct way and to use those tools to uh, maximize the resources that we're working with on a daily basis. We have limited, uh, limited arable land, limited water, and those are non-renewable resources. Our land or soil is a non-renewable resource, I would say, and water is becoming more and more scarce in the world uh, as the population increases. So to me, it's uh, environmentally responsible to utilize those tools to maximize the amount of food products that we can produce from a given unit of land area and a given uh, volume of water and a given unit of those resources. I apologize a bit if it's a little bumpy. It, it seems like maybe there's some terraces here. Um, what are the purposes? Of, like, why isn't the field just flat? Yeah, I don't know if you can tell or not, we're kind of on a hillside here. We kind of have, uh, you know, a lot of people think, when they hear Kansas, they think it's very flat. And it's certainly flat compared to other parts of the world, but we do have rolling hills. And we are farming on one of those hillsides in this particular field. And so these bumps that we're going over are terraces. And those terraces were put in um, a lot in the 1950s and 60s to... Uh, help with help reduce soil erosion, and so we talked about no-till farming and how that uh, reduces our soil erosion and helps us be a better steward of the soil. Um, back in the 1950s and 60s, no-till farming and leaving residue on top of the soil to protect it uh, and keep it in place that was not a real had really been thought about at that point in time, and so they built these terraces to slow down water as it runs down the hills. As a raindrop hits the soil, it has a lot of kinetic energy. And if you imagine a small little explosion right at that soil surface, when that raindrop falling from the sky hits the soil, it's like a little kinetic energy explosion uh, when it strikes that surface. And then that blows apart, that little explosion blows apart soil particles, which disperses them into the water, and then as more, all those raindrops are falling, as the rainfall becomes more intense, uh, that energy uh, grows, that, or that energy 
hands together and that water begins moving across the soil surface. And as it moves downhill, the volume of water moving down that hill gets bigger and it starts moving faster and then it starts carrying more soil down the hill with the water. And so these terraces were put in to slow down that water movement. So they come up against the, the side of that terrace or the bottom of it and it can't, of course, go over it. So they start moving horizontally with the land at a much lower pace and then uh, empties out the end of the terrace into a waterway that is grassed and then therefore the soil is protected uh, and that water then is allowed to exit the field. And so that was a soil conservation uh, practice that was implemented in a wide geogra uh, geogra geography of Kansas and the high plains in the 1950s and 60s and now uh, our ability to leave residue on top of the soil now to um, basically harness that, that kinetic energy when that raindrop falls now hits that residue instead of the soil and then it, that kinetic energy is then all captured by that residue which stays in place and then that water then just kind of trickles down to the soil surface very gently uh, from the surface of the residue so we don't have uh, all those soil particles moving with the water anymore. This field that we're in right now, about how many acres is this field? This field is about 75 acres. It is what we call an 80. So Kansas, uh, at least in this part of the state, is divided into sections. And a section is a square mile. And in every square mile, there is 640 acres. So that would be a section of land. Um, and when uh, when Kansas was being homesteaded back in the 1860s through the Homestead Act, uh, uh, that uh, family could come claim a quarter section. So that would be one quarter of one of those square mile sections, which would be 160 acres. And then this would be half of a quarter, therefore, what we would call an 80. So, um, and then a lot of the fields in this part of the state are either 80s or quarter sections, so either 80 acres or 160 acres. As you move further west in the state, the fields tend to get larger and maybe they have more, uh, you know, more section, entire section fields that one person owns and farms together um, of continuous land would be a little bit more common. So about how many acres of wheat do you plan on planting this fall? Yeah, we're about, uh, we're probably about 50 or 60 percent done right now, um, and we will probably, our plan, our plan is to plant about between 1,400 and 1,500 acres of wheat this fall, um, and you know, in farming you, plans are, are made, but there's always things that happen with the weather or uh, unforeseen. Uh, circumstances that may change those plans, but that's our plan today, and um, that's actually reduced. Um, wheat price is really low right now, probably um, probably actually the lowest it's been since I've been farming full-time uh, in 2003, and so um, it's very difficult to see how there's going to be very much economic return or, or profit in wheat this year, uh, unless the, if the price doesn't change significantly between now and harvest time next summer. So because of that, we have reduced our acres by about um, oh, probably 20% compared to what we typically would plant. Um, we're not eliminating all of our wheat acres or not taking a 50% reduction or something very large like that because economics isn't the only thing that drives our decision making. We also think about the environment that we talked about already and our cropping rotation and risk management. So uh, one of the reasons that wheat is important to us to plant, uh, for instance, these soybeans that we just harvested, the so uh, soybeans don't produce a lot of residue, and it's a residue that breaks down very quickly. And that's, so I typically in our rotation, all of our soybean acres 
are planted into wheat, which is a high residue, very durable residue crop. And so that's one of the reasons we haven't reduced our wheat acreage is more than what we've had because uh, environmentally we want to plant, get something growing in these fields uh, where these soybeans were just harvested so we keep that soil protected. So you said you're going to reduce your acres by maybe 20%. What are you going to do with those acres that would typically go into wheat? Yeah, those acres um, that we are reducing that typically would have gone into wheat actually uh, were, were fields that were wheat this summer, that we harvested this summer, and we typically would have planted wheat the second year in those fields. But rather than doing that, we planted, uh, in some of those fields, we planted a cover crop, uh, that triticale I was talking about, uh, to grow uh, through this fall and spring. And then we will um, terminate that cover crop and plant soybeans into those fields instead. From an economic standpoint, soybeans um, have a relative to wheat or a lot better price relative to wheat right now and from a profitability standpoint. So most of those fields that aren't going into wheat probably will go into soybeans um, this spring. So do you, um, you don't irrigate any of your land? Correct. Or we are all dry land. Uh, all of our fields are dry land. So do, do soybeans use more moisture or about the same as wheat? Soybeans use about the same amount of moisture as wheat does, maybe a little bit more, but the, the key difference is the time of year that they're using that moisture. Um, wheat is, uh, a lot of people think wheat is very drought tolerant, which it's, it has good drought tolerance, but the, the main difference with wheat is in Kansas is it's using the moisture or needing moisture when we are getting the, our, the most moisture, our rainfall pattern. So we usually, our, most of our rain comes in the months of April through June, and winter wheat is uh, flowering and making its grain during those months, which happens to be the time that it needs the most water. So it lines up with the climate pretty well versus soybeans um, need the most water during the drier, one of the drier and hotter times of our year, which is July and August and early September. So that's why soybeans, in some regards, could be from a drought for badging risk against drought. Soybeans probably, arguably, be a riskier crop than wheat. But that's one of the things our healthier soil is helping us with: is the ability to ca effectively capture store and then provide water to those soybeans when they're needing it uh, if it's not raining during that dry time of year here in central Kansas. So can you talk about how you choose what wheat seed you're planting, what variety you're choosing, um, and how you make those choices? Yeah, sure. We have a, a good um, a good number of varieties and companies uh, and public institutions that are providing wheat varieties for us to for us farmers to use um, here in Central Kansas. So there's probably you know, K-State is a really important um, land grant institution for winter wheat farmers in Kansas, and Dr. Alan Fritz is the wheat breeder there at K-State, and he is continually working uh, to develop new varieties that will be grown here in Kansas. In fact, he just today finished planting um, a nursery, what he calls a nursery, on one of our fields here where he is testing um, hundreds of varieties in very small, tiny little plots of land that he, will, he has planted and then he will watch uh, throughout the season, take notes on, and then uh, harvest this summer and these are varieties that he will be thinning down out of those uh, 100 varieties he may have two or three that end up being uh, varieties that we will plant on a wide scale as a farmer here in Kansas and then there's other private companies that are working on developing varieties as well so how I choose uh, the varieties we're using our farm, on our farm is I look at um, what are called strip trials or yield tests that are done uh, in our part of the state uh, each year. 
and that's uh, just a uh, maybe 10 to 20 different varieties that are planted right next to each other on in a particular field and then those varieties are harvested for yield and also um, kind of observed throughout the year for their agronomic characteristics and then uh, we take that information and, and study that um, and then make our variety selections from that from that uh, from that information and then also just how the varieties are performing on our on our own farm what our experience has been with them and um, how they fit our particular soils or our uh, cropping system and our management practices and our local climate. So do you usually plant one variety throughout your whole farm or do you choose several? This year we're planting um, four different varieties uh, on, on all, across all the fields. So this particular field here is getting um, one of the variety we're planting in this field is uh, AgriPro or Syngenta variety called Monument. And we planted some of it last year uh, and it performed really well for us and then did well in the yield trials also. Uh, seems to fit our climate in central Kansas well. So that's the variety we're using here. We also um, are planting a variety from Westbred, which is another private company uh, called 4458. Uh, that we planted quite a bit of last year that did well. Um, and we're planting some, another West Bread variety called Grainfield uh, this year on our farm. Uh, more limited acreage of that because it's a real late maturing wheat. Um, and so we um, kind of spread our risk by different maturities, different uh, varieties that mature differently. and. So Monument's fairly late, we're planting quite a bit of it. So we're kind of experimenting with Greenfield to see how it will do this year. So yeah, we, we usually plant between three and four varieties on our, on our farm. And we will usually plant a wheat variety for about, on average, two or three years. Um, Everest, we're not planting, we plant a, <coughs> excuse me, a lot of Everest, which is a variety developed by K-State, uh, Alan Fitz. And it was uh, for several years in a row has been the number one variety planted across the state of Kansas. Um, but this year we are kind of moving to some newer products. Um, and so that one kind of fell off our list. And we planted it for probably three or four years and it was a really good working variety for us. And we're going to watch really closely. Alan and K-State have uh, two new varieties out this year called Zumba and Larry that a lot of the seed growers around the state are using and so we'll be excited to plant some of those hopefully uh, next year when they become more available. So do you save any of your seed back um, to plant again or do you buy new seed every year or how do you how do you make those choices? Yeah we do save some of the uh, seed from our own farm each year we plant on uh, some of our acres and we, it's kind of, we do a mix of that uh, probably Probably the majority of our acres, or easily the majority of our acres that we plant each fall would be seed that we have saved uh, from one of our fields the prior year. And then we have a, a guy named Robert uh, that has a seed cleaning, uh, mobile seed cleaning truck, and he'll come to our farm and uh, clean that seed for us, take out the real small seeds that grow as well. Um, take out any weed seeds that are in there and get a nice, uh, clean seed product for us to plant. And we'll plant that on our fields uh, in the fall. But we also will plant a number of acres of certified seed that we will buy from a certified seed grower. And um, usually those fields are the ones that we would save when we save our seed or some seed to plant the next year from any of our own fields, it will be from those fields that we planted some certified seed on the prior fall that we purchased from some neighboring uh, seed growers here in the state. So it sounds like you have choices when it comes to seed and there's not really one or two companies that, that have a monopoly or that force you to choose their seed. It sounds like you have quite a few different options. We do have a lot of choices available 
available and freedom and what we use on our farms. I think there's, I think there's some misunderstandings and some misconnect, uh, some misunderstandings and misconceptions uh, out in the countryside and in urban areas that um, that one or two companies are telling us you have to plant this seed or use this particular GMO or use this particular product, and that's not really the case. Um, I have, uh, for winter weeds, um, I have a number of companies that I can choose from to, to purchase my seeds from, um, and, as well as uh, public institutions such as K-State. I think some of the misconceptions come from perhaps more of the, uh, the summer crops that we grow, such as corn and soybeans. Um, you know, there are no GMOs in winter wheat uh, currently, um, but corn and soybeans, however, do have GMOs uh, in, in seeds available uh, for, for me to utilize. And so when I plant one of those seeds that contains one of those GMOs, or what I would call a technology event that's been um, researched and developed by private industry, then I, uh, by, by law or by contract, cannot uh, plant, cannot save seed from that particular field that contains that proprietary technology and plant it on my field the following year. And the reason for that is those is private. It's it's an economic reason, basically. Those uh, private companies have hundreds of millions of dollars invested in that particular technology and that seed. And if they weren't uh, didn't have the ability from patent law and intellectual property rights to recapture their investments uh, that they've made in developing that technology, it would very quickly erode economic incentive for innovation um, in our farming practices and improvement in our farming practices. So I know it makes some folks uncomfortable that, that if I plant a seed that contains a proprietary technology that's developed in the, in the private marketplace and has uh, patented protection on it, that I can't plant a seed uh, for economic return the following year from that particular uh, original plant. But to me, it's very similar to um, innovation in any other um, in any other business. You know, if a car manufacturer um, makes an engine that uh, is much more efficient and and runs better and utilizes fuel better, and there's something that they've spent invested uh, hundreds of millions of dollars in in uh, developing that technology, if they can't um, have intellectual property rights or intellectual protection on that new uh, technology, and that intellectual property, and it just goes into the marketplace and they don't have an opportunity to recoup their investment, then it kind of stifles their innovation. So that's kind of, you know, it's just kind of a compar comparison, um, just a different, different uh, business. Do you feel that that technology, the GMO technology, uh, affects the safety of the crop and whether or not we should be eating it? Yeah, that's another good question. I think a lot of people, um, you know, GMO is can be a, a scary word. I think it's understandable that folks who are uh, not farming themselves or don't have a friend or a family member that they go visit their farm and, and see the things that we're doing. I think it's understandable that that uh, to be concerned about something that's a little bit harder to understand. You know, I know my wife asks me questions about uh, when she's buying things in the grocery store about you know, GMOs, and, and you know, we all want the best feed. The, we all want to feed our families the safest, most nutritious products that we can. And so I think it's healthy and good that people ask those questions. But to answer the question, uh, no, I, I, GMOs does not. Um, affect the safety of the uh, food products or the, the products that we're growing um, on our farm. Um, you know, we, the, all the GMO is is a, is a, a different genetic um, event uh, that is 
that is contained in, in that particular plant. And so it doesn't mean that there's any sort of um, synthetic product and that, you know, the seed, the seed looks exactly the same and it doesn't change any of the inherent characteristics of that seed or that, that particular product. And so now I don't have any safety concerns. There's been extensive, extensive testing done by the FDA um, and the USDA as, as these um, events are licensed and uh, approved for use uh, here in the U.S. And you know, we've been utilizing uh, GMOs um, in the U.S. for over, uh, let's see, uh, about two decades now. And there have been to date uh, zero, uh, zero cases of any allergic reaction or um, specific uh, ill health um, that's been caused by any uh, any GMO, uh, and that's across two decades. And so, um, so yeah, for me personally, I understand why people uh, have those questions and ask those, and I think it's a fair question. And, and you know, my opinion is, and my experience as a farmer, and someone who cares about my family and what they eat, that no, I don't have any concerns or um, about. Uh, GMOs posing any concerns to food safety or um, the, uh, the benefits or uh, of eating a, a particular food. So I was wondering if maybe you could show us what's going on on your screen over here um, and talk a little bit about the technology in the tractor. Sure. Um, so this uh, screen right here uh, in front of me, um, you can see the steering wheel. I've got it up right now, and you can kind of see that dark line um, just to the right there of the tractor. It's a little bit hard to see in the residue, but that's the uh, the last pass where the cedar went, where it placed seeds into the soil. So we're going on a straight line that is east and west. So this screen right here is actually like a computer. It's a touch screen. Uh, similar to an iPad, although it's not an iPad, it's uh, made by John Deere. Um, and so I touch the screen or different uh, uh, buttons on that screen and it will show me different information. And then it's also controlling different functions of the seeder and the tractor. So uh, we've got a couple different menus here. This top window, if you will, is our telling us uh, information about our GPS. And so that white line that we are driving on there, you can kind of see that tractor symbol there and the cedar and the blue being painted behind it that's the GPS and we are this tractor is driving itself right now straight down that line and you can see the other lines going across the field here the landscape those are those lines are set at every uh, on 36 foot intervals which our cedar is 36 feet wide and so the tractor is driving itself on that line and so which means back behind us at the edge of the cedar over there, um, it's going right next to the pass that we made previously. So we're not overlapping, but we're also not skipping. And so we're being very efficient with our seed and our fertilizer and the fuel that we're using um, with, uh, with the tractor being able to auto steer itself. And then below that window, we see all this information. These are our three tanks of uh, product that we have uh, back on the air cart. Uh, the front one and the middle one have seed in them. And then the back one has the starter fertilizer in it. That's just basically uh, like nutrients for the wheat to help it, that small little wheat plants be healthy when it gets started growing. So that's, uh, this computer is running the, and determining the rates that I have entered and it's controlling the rates as our, ch our speed changes and, and we change um, as we go through the field. So, and so we're at the end of the pass now. You can see the waterway there. So we're gonna make a turn. And so I turn the steering wheel, which turns off the auto steer. And then I get it somewhere close the next pass and push the resume button and now the tractor is driving itself and we'll drive it straight down the next pass here uh, where we're seeing. And so this is also making a um, uh, as applied map for us. 
um, as we see, there's, and it's recording a lot of different information, so we'll, I'm sorry, it's kind of rough. We'll look, look at our map here. Okay, so here's a, a map of the field that we're planting. You can see those pink lines are the boundaries of the field, and that little green circle is us moving through the field. And you can see the different colors on there. These That's showing us what rate of seed that we are planting um, in, in this field. Uh, so the red rates would be higher and the yellow would be lower. Now we're putting a really consistent rate across this entire field. Uh, but in some fields, we may want to vary our fertilizer rate, uh, put less on in less productive areas or more in more productive areas. And so this um, computer will also be able to control uh, those prescriptions, is what we would call them, of being able to put those different rates on in the, those different areas of the field. So it's both controlling a lot of the functions of our tractor and our seeding equipment and uh, also recording a lot of the information that we are doing here that we can study and learn from later. Then when we combine this field, our combines will have a similar screen or computer in them that will capture the yield data in real time and geographically referenced uh, every second that we can make a nice map out of and see uh, and quantify where the most productive areas of the field are and where the least productive less productive areas are and, um, and better fine-tune our, our management. Thank you, Justin. Um, and I also want to thank you for inviting us out to ride with you while you planted your wheat this afternoon. Um, I would just like to ask you if there's anything, maybe um, anything else you'd just like consumers or other farmers or perhaps even international buyers who might be listening um, to know about Kansas wheat and about your uh, family operation. Yeah, sure. Um, you know, wheat, wheat is obviously a very important crop, not only, not only to our farm, uh, not only to our state, uh, not only to our country, but, you know, really to, to the entire world population. I, you know, wheat is wheat is um, a grain that has been uh, part of the that has provided a tremendous amount of nutrition for us humans across thousands of years, and it's still one of the most important grains um, from a nutritional aspect uh, for for humans across the entire globe. And so, you know, just for me, it's, uh, what that means to me is not, when I come back now with the heritage of my uh, family uh, farming for generations here in Kansas, and my family farm today with my dad and my brother and, and my children planting wheat here in the fall. The weather's nice. We have beautiful fall colors out. Um, it's just a really uh, rewarding, special, meaningful time of year. And I hope what that translates into for uh, whoever it might be here in the U.S. that would consume some flour that originated from uh, some of the one of the, one of our family's fields here in Central Kansas. You know, they'll never, in many cases, in most all cases, won't have an opportunity to meet me. But just know that you know I do the, the wheat that we raise on our farm. Um, we raise with a lot of passion, a lot of care, and a lot of um, a lot of attention to stewardship, of just being a steward to uh, the responsibilities we are given with the natural resources and raising such a fundamental food, uh, nutritional product such as such as wheat that will be uh, consumed around the entire globe. And so, I would just uh, hope that any consumers or 
uh, families that may watch this or international buyers of wheat uh, may have a sense of the diligence and the, um, the care that we take in doing the best we can uh, to produce uh, a very good quality product and do it in a way that is honoring to the wonderful resources that we have to be stewards of and honoring um, to our family's heritage and our family's future here in central Kansas and I and I hope that that um, is meaningful to them and and you know my story is not unique I, I you know that sentiment is shared across um, most all farms uh, here in Kansas that are raising wheat and and uh, it, it's not unique but it's really easy I think to become disconnected from that as uh, we have a more urban uh, culture and, and society and so I would just leave folks with that that um, I hope they are, are reassured of the families like ours that are working out here on farms that uh, we care a lot about what we're doing and we're proud and we understand that we have um, certainly like any uh, business there's been mistakes made in the past and a lot of things that uh, we still have a lot to improve upon but we're working hard to continually do better and we care a lot about the, the work that we do and just appreciate any folks who have taken time to, to watch this and spend time with us today or in the future and all the best to them. Thank you, Justin.